Erica Wright is a 1999 graduate of the Webb School, and she took her degree after her experience in Bellbuckle. She took a degree from Columbia University a few years later. She's the author of a recently published collection of poems, Instructions for Killing the Jackal, as well as a chapbook entitled Silt. Her poems have appeared in various publications, including Black Blackbird, Denver Quarterly, Drunken Boat, From the Fish House, New Orleans Review, Pequod, and a number of others. Um, what a delight to have two Webb alums speak their truths to us two days in a row. In addition to that delight, though, is an unspoken challenge to all of us in the audience. What, what can we make of those words? Better yet, what truths can we imagine ourselves sharing on this stage 10 or 15 years from now? Uh, what will we discover about the world and ourselves if we can find and follow our bliss? Yesterday, Curtis Jenkins performed his understandings of his truth. Today, Erica Wright will perform the same. We love the label, and on the surface, it's very simple. Curtis is a preacher. Erica is a poet. On a deeper level, of course, there is poetry in Curtis's preaching, and I suspect a little preaching in Erica's poetry. As you students who listen to your elders, all of you need to understand you are potential preachers and poets and a million other things. If all of you were first graders and I asked you to hold up your hands if you were artists, most of you would hold your hands right up. Um, after all, you can draw and paint and create things and you do it every day as a first grader. If I were to ask how many of you were writers, probably all of you would, would raise your hands. You write all the time. But if I were to ask you as seniors the same questions, I doubt we'd have a unanimous response. Um, hands down, one of you might say, um, Aaron is the real artist in our class. Uh, another voice may say, Emily is the real writer in our class. Um, Aaron is a gifted artist, Emily is a gifted writer, but that's beside the point. After 11 years of formal schooling, uh, it's easy to narrow your vision of what you are and who you might become. Well, our two speakers have news. We are all artists, we are all writers, and we are all potentially a million different things. We owe it to ourselves and to others to never forget that. Erica is here in part to remind us of how artfully the written and spoken word can convey emotion and meaning. Not long ago, she, like Curtis, sat where you were sitting. Today, I encourage you to do much more than merely sit there. I urge you to practice the habit of attention, as Erica practices the art of expression. She has, I assure you, chosen the words of her poems with great care. Let us honor her by paying, paying careful attention to those precious words. Erica, it's a pleasure to have you amongst us. Please, uh, if everybody would join me in welcoming Erica back to Webb. <laughs> I also don't have a really great cave story, unfortunately, to share with you guys. Uh, I did go uh, caving with Mr. Walker, and uh, it is quite an experience. I hope you guys all do that while you're here. Um, I grew up in War Trace, Tennessee, so it just sounds rude from you guys. Uh, so I, I thought I might actually start with some snake stories, since that was a pretty common theme in my, in my childhood. Um, I don't know if this is a calculator or what, but I'm going to... <laughs> um, uh, so my brother also graduated from Webb in 1994, and he lives in New York as well. So uh, two weekends ago, we were sitting in a trendy Brooklyn coffee shop swapping snake stories. Snakes in trees, snakes in barns, snakes in our living room crawling up the fireplace. And that was a particularly <laughs> excellent snake story. Uh, this was Park Slope, Brooklyn, not Bushwick, hit the ground, we hear gunfire, Brooklyn. So we were surrounded by an assortment of hipsters and flannel and moms with thousand dollar strollers. Most people who live in New York City come from somewhere else, so it wasn't unusual for two southerners to be chatting together in a corner. When the conversation turned from my brother's new baby to snakes, though, 
it was clear that we were not city folk at heart. Sure, I know how to break someone's knees now, but really, who doesn't? <laughs> My brother and I reminisced uh, about a dozen or so encounters with rat, black, and chicken snakes, not to mention a couple of leeches one time before the baby woke up from her nap. We decided that these encounters, not Freudian dream theory or biblical illusion, made us videophobics. I just learned that word, so I'm, I'm happy I pronounced it correctly. Um, I, I do poetry readings fairly often, uh, and I used to put my hometown in my bio, but too many people pronounce it wart race, and it's really hard to be cool after that. It's hard to get up in the podium and be like, yeah, I'm awesome. Um, I come from wart race, Tennessee. <laughs> because my audience is often startled by the number of alligators and creatures and, of course, snakes, because there are a lot of snakes in my poems. The question most poets dread is, what is your poetry about? One popular definition of poetry is that which cannot be paraphrased. And if you think about your favorite poem, and I'm sure you guys all have a favorite poem, so think of that right now, uh, you'll find this is a pretty solid definition. Uh, my personal favorite poem is by W.B. Yeats. It's called The Second Coming. And if I, I'm going to try to paraphrase it for you guys. It's about a falcon that gets lost, and then there's an apocalypse, and then there's this sort of monster, lion, man, thingamabob that sort of appears in the desert. And there are some birds in there along the way. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't sound so hot, right? It doesn't sound something you might want to read. So if you want to make a poet sweat, really you just have to ask her, uh, what, what's your poetry about? In order to avoid the sudden nausea and sweaty palms induced by this question, I sort of changed it when people ask me. I really just think of it as, you know, what sort of things show up in your poems? There's actually a fancy sounding poetry term for this. It's called uh, a radical given. And the theory is that all artists and perhaps all people have particular worries or obsessions which they feel compelled to tackle repeatedly. Uh, until they arrive at some sort of elusive understanding. And some people even claim that we're all writing the same poem, or composing the same song, or having the same discussions again and again. Uh, this is a little bit uh, too much like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain for me. Uh, it's a little too bleak is the main idea. So I, I choose to think of radical givens as what speaks to us at a basic level. So what matters to you? That would be your radical given. So when people ask me what my poetry is about, I sort of list these current obsessions. And I say I'm from a speck of a place called War Trace, Tennessee. Uh, when people ask you what you do, or what classes you're taking, or what activities you're involved in, what they're really asking you is, who are you? What, what actually matters to you? And despite living in New York City for 12 years now, I'm a Southerner at heart, as I bet many of you are. I write about this landscape that teems with natural wonders, mouth-watering food, which I've really missed, <laughs> and kindness alongside its meth labs and mosques and mosque protests and homophobia. I try to reconcile these two faces as I'm sure you all do. What this school teaches us, if nothing else, is to be part of the group that fights against injustices and unfairness. The question is how to do it. In our coffee shop chat, my brother mentioned the company Charity Water, which maybe some of you guys have heard about because they have a really um, terrific advertising campaign. And what the company does is they provide drinkable water to developing countries. The founder is a guy by the name of Scott Harrison, who is a sort of hot shot club promoter, living a kind of glamorous uh, life in New York City. And he decided one day that he wanted to use his talents in a different field, to do something that mattered to him. He defines charity as, quote, the ability to use one's position of influence, relative wealth, and power to affect the lives for the better. Charity is singular and achievable, end quote. When talking about nonprofits, the word achievable doesn't get thrown around very often. And I know this because I work for one. Uh, I'm an editor at an art and politics magazine where we try to tell the stories that aren't being told in other media outlets. They don't have to be about campaign elections, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> that would be boring after a while. Uh, but they do have to be stories or poems that matter, that have something at stake in them. William Carlos Williams famously wrote, 
It is difficult to get the news from homes, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. He meant, and I'm going to try to paraphrase some poetry, so hold on to your hats. What he meant was that without trying to understand the world around us and the people in it, the people sitting next to you, we turn to violence, we cannibalize. Williams, of course, was a country doctor, so that's a profession known for helping people. Um, but if a former club promoter can raise over $40 million for drinkable water, what can you do? What skills can you use? I mentioned charity water not only because I've been thinking about it recently, but because it contradicts the, notions that today, the notion that today's young people are self-involved, which I'm, I'm sure you've all said, heard before, and resented. Uh, sure, I, like all your teachers, really wish texting and smartphones had never been invented. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> but what today's young people are, what you are really, is creative. You're innovative. You're the innovative generation. You're thinking outside the box. Uh, Scott Harrison was able to make his nonprofit a success because he actually just ignored the older models of nonprofits and used his natural talents with social media. Harrison knew he was good at promotion, just as you all know that you're good at something, or you will know in a few years. At present, Charity Water has benefited close to 2 million people. When my brother and I discuss snakes, which actually we don't do that very often, so we don't get together and share these stories, but that just happened to happen. Uh, what we're really talking about is fears, and unnatural ones at that. Of course, as you might already know, you can't really get away from your fears. Uh, in 2007, when I read about a woman in Brooklyn who found a seven-foot python in her toilet, I spent the week trying to decide if it was better to leave the toilet lid down and risk something striking at me when I lifted it, <laughs> or to leave the toilet lid up and risk stumbling across scales in a closet. I finally, after some deliberation, chose toilet lid down, and then I developed this sort of ninja-like move to kind of pop it open. Um, <laughs> and, and then, a cobra got loose from the Bronx Zoo, and my anxieties moved in entirely different places. <laughs> so, what is my poetry about? It's about electric fences, and Greek mythology, and radios, and war, and ghosts, and failures, and sometimes trying again. It's what all poetry is about, trying to get a little closer to understanding the world, world around us, so that we're not afraid of it. Sometimes that means starting with home, with Tennessee, with War Trace, with this very room in which you all sit, trying to figure out your own radical givens, what matters most to you. And so I'd like to read a few poems, and I'm going to start with one that's actually in praise of snakes. And it's called In Defense of Ophidia. Some species exhibit well. The Appalachian triumvirate, for example, rattlesnake, cottonmouth, copperhead. But the Amazonians are cramped with nothing to defend Nothing to test the circumference of their jaws. Now the goat, now the child, at seven, at ten. If you're playing at the base of a hollowed oak, if you're climbing up the hay rack or turning thirteen and protecting the front porch infant, pity Cleopatra, but pity too the means of execution. No edges, these creatures, only curls of body so that everywhere they touch is intimate. Mistaking time for cause and effect. Let's go down to the cemetery and watch alligators. Let's throw sticks at them to make sure they know we're there, then run to make sure they know we're better than them. Later you can propose, and I'll say yes, but really mean no. I won't tell you so until you're sweating at the altar and ready to run away with or without me. It's all the same. A hundred years ago, you might have caught me in some shaded lane and insisted I take your umbrella. A hundred years from now, you'll blow kisses through a hologram. She'll have emerald hair that makes you want to found mining colonies. Remember that busted up sword? It had rust stains older than us, and you cut a cattail down with one blow. Next summer, you said, there will be cattails for miles, and ran with the seeds blowing behind you. But they weren't so much like tales as explosions, and I was caught on the wrong side of history. Taking a bunch. Near enough to hear the 
rough language of men. I watched my father and uncles string an electric fence between yard and field. One read the worry on my face, explained how the shock just pinched be so big, just told them their limits. When left alone, I threw sticks at it, then grabbed hold, felt my skin snap, released. That was before I knew to ask if we really feel pain differently, when I would tumble from trees and my brother would swear it would hurt less if I didn't cry. So I didn't. And later, when someone I loved said he didn't and never had, I managed to nod. <coughs> Numb myself until morning when I learned whiskey's a lousy anesthesia. <laughs> Overcame self-pity by imagining soldiers losing limbs, dying anyway. I would think of them to keep from laughing during church, but it really was funny the way the preacher believed men could help falling for other men any more than I could have, stop from grabbing that fence, seeing for myself if I were being lied to. That's actually a rather old poem, and I read it a few years ago, and afterwards someone came up to me and got really close, it's really in my personal space, <laughs> and said, I disagree with this poem. And I thought, okay, well, I, I felt they wanted to talk about gay rights, so I got kind of puffed up. I was like, yeah, I mean, bring it on. And he says, I grabbed an electric fence before, and it didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it hurting quite a bit, so I don't know. I, maybe I just remember it. I'm not going to try it again, though. That was, that was a one time event. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I'm going to read one more poem from my new collection and then a few uh, newer things. Uh, this poem is actually in some ways about my grandmother, uh, who I was imagining as a mermaid, someone who's lived this nice full life and is rather ready to return to the sea. Um, so it's called Mermaid, and it's in three parts. Three short parts, don't stress. Uh, mermaid. One. I used to think the devil lived in Fayetteville, Tennessee. <laughs> Though there's a sort of godliness in the abandoned music shop, where a Romanian teen once bellowed at me over a violin to play, this hand must be stronger. This after getting glass in my shoes from the parking lot, after wanting to be the source, smashing bottles to watch the greens and browns make oceans to lose your sons in. At bottom, you get infrared glasses, see God in scales. Here I must be watered. Every morning a spectacle, and there's a woman for that. Two. I prefer the quarantine where we banked on makeshift weapons, anything that could file to a point over the toilet. We put our faith in herbs. Shirts were swung out the windows, and even this was safe somehow. For those of us who fell to scarlet fever, panic had to be swallowed whole. Bats tucked into our chimneys before the hot final hush of light silenced over the ridge. Maybe we didn't think of them at all, not so much nestled as crammed, one on another in a square foot of brick. But one summer, I'm telling you, there were bats every night. Three. Stag, you say, as if you meant wildlife. Not a polite word for driving oneself to a party and chatting out other old ladies who'd rather, and would there a polite word for this, be elbow deep in the fish pond, it took out living one husband and shooing three children out to earn. I like fireworks as much as a nest. That is not the question. Now is the hour of miracles when no one's watching, throwing back. So I don't actually have a TV hooked up in my apartment. I tried with the antennas and all that, but it was beyond my technical ability. So I just watched Netflix, which means, as many of you probably know, you don't watch a variety of things. You really just watch one show repeatedly. You watch it over and over again. And I've been watching the show Bones. Does anyone know the show? Yes? Uh, so so I, I basically walk around looking for different ways that can kill people at all times. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching the show for about a month now. And that's enough to 
silence the witnesses. Bed posts fall under less spy, more convenient, and can be wiped clean. All the women line their eyes with coal, let the points extend, and this is only dangerous in cases of mistaken identity, doppelgangers. If you meet yours, fill yours. Even if your fingers resist, refuse to break the windpipe of yourself, but it's not yourself. Only a mirror image with a better job, boyfriend, Labrador retriever to your mutt. We hunt a wild boar with spears made from brooms and cut mason jars. If the beast spoke, he would tell the story of three little girls who used their pinafores as leashes and nooses. Marigold left school one afternoon and came back a suitcase, complete with destination stickers for Barcelona, New Guinea, and the Arctic Circle. It's hard to gauge the recoil without television shows that compare Apaches to Maori warriors. As if this weren't as awful as little moon-based killers, you and me, if we could disappear as easily as we mind the gap, afraid to have our bodies severed by oncoming trains. And that last one is my biggest fear. I don't want to be severed by a train. <laughs> I don't want to fall in the middle of space. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when you swear your blood coagulates into patterns that mean something, that you're an oracle or something, based on the edges of a drop. This means war. This means a girl will poison herself with cherry pits, but it will be an accident. Don't wander so far into the forest. Once inside, even the birds grow teeth in their mandibles. They don't get around. Or if you must, you must. But take me with you when you slide into the bark and ground. And I'm just going to read one more poem. Uh, it's, uh, it's about a girl who may or may not be the last person uh, left in the world. And it's called uh, Lola and the Apocalypse. She sees catastrophe in every crow, in every knockdown clothesline, mostly volcanoes and floods, but sometimes scourges, blue tongues. Waves that forget their place and storm into cities. Her mind stops at flesh peeling back from the bone until it's white as milk, the kind that makes grown men grow breasts, and they think that this is a catastrophe, but it's not. Once, when men were automobiles, the roads were slick with sweat. They gleamed. Days were lost to spectatorship, making bets on which color would rise up out of the dark. Our girl made $20 on Violet, but someone stole it. Who knows who? It was hard to tell one crow from another. You couldn't cross for fear of getting hit, a parade of reds and browns. And maybe the afterlife's a bookshop, and she's been good, so she'll get to loiter by pop culture slash crime instead of business slash money. <coughs> from her perch, she'll count personality types. The schizotypals are never object when she fondles her frontal lobes that gray, dirty satin, elbow deep in it. Her epigraph will remain unwritten because there's no one left to scrawl platitudes. For every pain, there is a duck with your name on it. But there aren't any ducks. At ponds worldwide, they eat each other when no small hands toss crumbs and shoot away the geese that strike as if their bodies are lit fuses. When cities were coal mines, the children played color games too, but it was hard to determine a winner. Lola knew a man there who didn't balk at anything, could stare down whatever slime belly beast approached their home. She can't recall his name, but it could have been Roger. <laughs> they had books too, mostly cultural studies. Maybe I'm not alone, she thinks. Maybe the devil stalks me right this minute, wants me to run, make it more exciting. Lola sits down on the nearest ledge. Ha, she thinks. Ha ha. She doesn't notice the fissure at first. It sneaks between floorboards, and when she pries them apart, her fingertips bleed in protest. They drip onto the bleached white worms that catch fire in the light. And then the floor collapses, and then the world. The survivors are called hostages, or will be in the near met. Hostages in pines, hostages in barns, hostages in the great wide open that makes 